Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. You must go through all the math problems, or at the very least, as many as you can. If there is a problem that gives you trouble, we have, all, we have solved almost all the math problems already. If there is a problem that gives you trouble, that gives you difficulty, you will find the solution to the problem from day number 251 through 400. This book that I'm holding in my hand, the second edition, contains almost exactly the same problem and in most cases on the same page numbers as the ones that appeared in the first edition with, few, with, with just few exceptions. If you happen to be interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, we have already solved every single problem from this book. If you happen to be interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Original problems, original solutions tend to be a little lengthy and they tend to be a little bit in-depth. Right now, we are in the process of solving some quantitative comparison questions from this book here, the 10th edition of the General GRE. Quantitative comparison questions, because the other two books do not contain enough quantitative comparison questions to get some extra practice from day number 401 we begin solving some questions from here. Right now, we are on page number 208. Please turn to it. Page number 208. As a matter of fact, first, we're going to do the problem which is on page number 207. Problem number 6. Problem number 6. With a percentile of 83 on page 207. Here's what we're told. We are, we are given two quantities, 3x squared and 3x whole squared. Now listen very carefully. The reason I'm doing it again is because we did this problem about three days ago on, on day number 417. We did this problem already. The reason I'm doing it again is because when, when we did the problem, when I did this problem the first time, I made a slight mistake. The way it stands right now, the way I have presented the problem to you here, column A and column B, if, if x happens to be zero, if x happens to be zero, this quantity will be 0 and this quantity will be 0, the answer will be C. If x does not happen to be 0, it doesn't matter what x is. If x is anything other than 0, the answer will not be C. It will be something else. You see how we show our work? It answer, what that answer will be really is of no interest to us. What matters to us is that if, it, if x is 0, the answer will be C, the two quantities will be equal. If x is not equal to 0, then answer will be that one of these two quantities is going to be bigger than the other. They are not going to be equal to each other. That's all it matters. What matters is that they will no longer be equal to each other. As you can see, we have conflicting answer. So the way I presented the problem here, in this case, the answer of the problem would be D. But that is not how the problem appears in the book. What I left out in haste is the fact that the book specifically tells us that x does not equal 0. x does not equal 0. We did the proper work. On, on 417, we did the proper work, we had the proper answer, but I left out a crucial information. Without that bit of information, the answer would be D. Without this information, the answer would be D. But now that we know that X cannot be equal to zero, we are told that X cannot be equal to zero, let's start the, let's start the problem again. Let's, problem, let's start the problem again, and what we will do is as follows. So this is 3X squared. This, when we open the parentheses, is going to be 9X squared. Now what we have to understand is that this x bar, x squared part, because it is because of the fact that it is being squared, it does not matter whether x turns out to be a negative quantity or whether x turns out to be a positive quantity. By the time you square it, it's a positive quantity. This is a positive quantity, and this is a positive quantity. And since they are positive, since they are both positive quantities, and they are exact same quantity, x squared versus x squared, because it appears in the both columns, we can divide both columns by x squared. It goes. And now, of course, 3 versus 9, of course, 9 is bigger, the answer is B. Do you understand? That's what it is. Let's, do, let's move on then. I just wanted to get it out of my system because without that crucial bit of information, the problem, the answer would have been D. Let's do the next problem, number 10. Problem number 10 is still on page number 207. Problem number 10 is 64 percentile. We are at problem number 10. Here is what problem is given to us. We are told that this angle is 30 degrees. This is A, B, and C. Just give me one brief second. I'm not going anywhere. I'm still here, as you can hear me. 
And what we're being asked to compare is AB versus BC. What is missing here? What is missing here? We have to compare the length of side AB versus BC. What is missing here is this angle here. We do not know what this angle is. If this angle happens to be 30 degrees, and if this is 30 degrees, then these two sides will be equal because it will be an isosceles triangle. So if, if angle C equals 30 degrees, then AB would be equal to BC, in which case the answer would be C. On the other hand, if angle C happens to be greater than 30 degrees, if, then they will not be equal. If angle C happens to be more than 30 degrees, 30 plus, this is how we write it, this is 30 degrees, and this is 30, something more than 30 degrees. Since this is more than 30 degrees, then the side facing the, side facing the greater angle will be the longer side. Side AB will be longer. AB would be longer than BC, and in this case, the answer would be A. On the other hand, if angle C is less than 30 degrees, then AB will be less than BC, in which case the answer would be B. If it happens to be, if it happens to be less than 30 degrees, then because this is a smaller angle, this will be the smaller side, the side facing, side facing angle C is AB, side facing 30 degrees is BC, BC will be longer because BC is a bigger angle. That's what it is. As you can see, <coughs> we're getting conflicting answers and therefore the answer is D. What is missing here is this angle right here. We do not know what that angle is and without knowing angle C, we cannot tell, uh, we cannot ascertain which, which side is longer if they are equal. That's all. So that was number 10. Let's move on then. The next question that we want to do is 11. 11, 12, we're going to keep on going. Number 11. Question number 11. Question number 11. On page 207 still. Page 207. Question number 11 was 75 percentile and we are told that the net income net income is given by this expression right here x squared plus x minus 380. So we have a firm we are told and the firm's net income is given by this expression where x represents the number of uh, units produced where x represents the number of units produced and what we are being asked to compare is the in column A we have number of units, number of units produced or sold, number of units sold, number of units that must be sold for the net income to equal zero. How many, how many units does the firm need to sell in order for the net income to be zero? And in column B, they give us 10. So here's what's going on. So we are told that net income is given by this expression. They're looking for how many units we need to sell, number of units that must be sold, number of units that must be sold for the net income to be zero. We want net income to equal to zero. First of all, before, before we go any further, out of, just out of curiosity, what do we call the situations where the firm has a net income of zero? They're not losing any money, they're not making a loss, nor are they making any profit. What do we call the situations where the net income is such that, uh, your, 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 rather, your total revenue is such that you're barely covering the expenses. You're covering the expenses, you have nothing left over, and you're not short. This situation that they're describing is what, what is known as break-even. They're looking for the break-even point. They're looking for the break-even point. It's very simple. We said this expre expression is equal to zero and that will be the situations now whatever the value of x happens to be that's how many units they have to produce to figure out what their break-even point is. But we're not going to actually waste our time solving this equation, this quadratic equation because these questions as we know are called quantitative comparison. We just have to compare the thing. So the smart thing here would be simply put in this 10 here and see what happens. Because 10 is what we are comparing with. question that we are asking here is not, for as far as we are concerned, the question here is not what is, what is the number of units they need to produce in order for their net income to be zero. That is not the question. 
the question for us is because it is quantitative comparison question. The question is, does the, uh, the do they need to produce do they need to produce fewer than ten or more than ten or equal to ten units in order for their net income to be zero? So we find out by putting ten in. It. If you put ten in there, ten squared plus ten, as you can see, ten squared plus ten is barely one hundred and ten. 110 minus 380 minus 380, 110 minus 380 is going to be negative. They're losing money. Obviously, they need to produce more than 10 units. They need to produce this quantity is more than 10 units. They need to produce more than 10 units. The answer is A. Answer is A. What if, what if instead of 10, in the second column, they had put down 11? Well, in that case, nothing would change. Instead of, instead of 10, we put down 11 here. And still, 11 squared plus 11, 121 plus 121 plus 11 is nowhere close to 380. The answer is still A. What if instead of 11, they had put down, instead of 11, they had put down 15? Let's put down 15 here, see what happens. 15 squared, as we know, is 225 plus 15. 225 plus 15 is 240. They're still losing money. 240. Minus 380, they're losing money big time, still. Of course, they need to produce more than 15 units in order, in order for them to break even. So break even point, forget about 10, break even point is actually higher than 15. Do you understand? The answer is A. Their break even point is higher than 15. If, if the 15 appeared here. If they put down 10 here, just put down 10. Don't do any more work than is necessary. Do you understand? So that was it. The answer is A. Number 12. Number 12. In number 12, on page 208, we have a problem where the percentile is 49%. Half the people missed it. We have a rectangle with area 30. What we are being asked to compare is the perimeter of the rectangle R versus 25. Column B column A, as always. Even if I don't put down column A and column B, of course you know that's what it is, because we're dealing, we're dealing with quantitative comparison questions. We're comparing the two quantities. So we, we are told that we have a rectangle whose area is 30. What are we going to do? We have to compare the perimeter of the rectangle versus 25. Let's make up a rectangle with the area 30. Let's make up something simple. How about 5 by 6? We have a rectangle 5 by 6. A 5 by 6 which will have an area of 30 the perimeter of this guy would be would be 5 plus 5 is 6 and 6 plus 5 plus 5 is 10 5 plus 5 is 10 and 6 plus 6 is 12 12 plus 10 is 22 22 versus 25 22 versus 25 25 is bigger the answer in this case is b but that's not the end of the story is that the only possible is that the only possible is that the only possible triangle that be, a rectangle that we can think of can we, can we think of, think of something weird the answer is yes Yes, we can think of something weird. How about a rectangle that happens to be like this? A 1 by 30. A 1 by 30 also has an area of 30. But now, the perimeter of this guy is going to be 30 plus 30. It's already more than, six, it's, it's already more than 25. Whatever this perimeter of this guy is, we don't have to waste our time. 30 plus 30 is already more than 25. So this, this quantity is going to be more than 25. Now the answer is A. Before the answer was B. We're getting a conflicting answer and therefore the answer is D. The answer to this problem is D. You must always remember to plug in nasty numbers which are 0, 1, negative and fractions. Put the nice number first time around and then the nasty numbers. Nasty numbers begin with this is the, this is the list, this is, this is the order in which you should go. Try 0 first, if the 0 is not allowed then 1, then the negative and then the fraction. Don't mess with the fraction until the very end when it is absolutely necessary, when there is no other choice. We couldn't try zero because you can't have a side, the length of a side equal to zero, so we tried with, started with one. Let's move on then. Before we go to the next problem, just purely out of curiosity, can you tell me what is the maximum possible, what's the maximum possible area, or rather maximum possible perimeter you can have in a rectangle whose area is 30? See, this, this rectangle has the area of 30, 
It is uh, 1 by 30, it has an area of 30, this is 5 by 6, which is the area of 30. What's the maximum possible perimeter we can have? Maximum possible perimeter. You see, this is 62. 30 plus 30 is 60, 60 plus 2 is 62. 62 is more than 25. Is that the highest we can get? I want you to pause the video for a second if you have to. Pause the video if you cannot give me the answer immediately. Pause the video because once I give out the answer, it will be no fun. Pause it and think for yourself as to what is the most we can have for the perimeter of this of a rectangle such as this one, such as this one whose area is 30. I'll give you two seconds. See, here's what's going on. Okay, let's do it up here. We had a we had a one by thirty. The perimeter of this guy is perimeter of this guy is thirty plus thirty sixty and sixty two. But why start there? We could have had we could have had one by ten versus three hundred versus three hundred. In which case the perimeter of this perimeter of this guy is going to be more than six hundred. It's going to be six hundred plus two tenth, one tenth and one tenth. But why stop there? If we could have one over one hundred versus and one and three thousand, three thousand three thousand times one over three thousand divided by one hundred is going to give us the area of thirty. Now the perimeter is more than six thousand. Why stop there? We could have had something like this. Now the perimeter is going to be more than sixty thousand. It can go on forever. The perimeter of this thing can be more than sixty thousand. Perimeter of this thing can be more than sixty million. Perimeter of this perimeter, perimeter of this rectangle could be more than 60 billion, 60 trillion. There is no limit. The correct answer to my question was, the correct answer to my question was, the perimeter of this thing can approach infinity. Can approach infinity. It will never be infinity. The perimeter of this thing will never equal infinity, obviously, but it will approach infinity. It will be infinity asymptotically, as this approaches zero. Do you understand? Now I do not know why I go around using these words because I'm not sure if you have learned this word or not. Asymptotically that is. You know what an asymptote is, do you? I didn't want to digress all this thing. I wanted to keep on going at a, at a decent speed. And I messed it up. But since I got into... And it's not even... We haven't even covered in our vocabulary words. I'm looking at the list here. I'm going to make a note to myself because this is a good word to learn. This is a good word to learn, asymptotically. Let me give you an example of what an asymptote is. Of course you know what an asymptote is. If you have a, say a situation like this, this, this relationship, you see it approaches, it approaches zero, but it will never touch zero. This is called an asymptote. And the adverb is asymptotically. So as this as this side approaches zero, but it can never be zero, of course side can never be zero, but as it approaches zero asymptotically, the perimeter of this thing will approach infinity asymptotically. Let's keep on going. Number twelve, uh, number thirteen. I don't know why I have this digression. I said to myself I'm gonna keep a decent pace without yapping. But yapping, I must do. 66% was the percentile here. This is a very straightforward problem. Here is the situation. We are told that this angle is less than 30. This angle is less than 30. Oh, sorry, less than 90. We are told that this angle is less than 90. We are told that this angle is 20. This is y, and the question is, we have to compare y versus 70. y versus 70. Let's see what we can do here. Instead of writing it like this, that x is less than 90, let's write it like this. x equals something less than 90. 90 with a minus sign on top means it is something less than 90. x equals something less than 90. Now if this outside angle is something less than 90, and because of the fact that this is a straight line, that tells us that this inside one has to be something more than 90. It would have to be something more than 90. Something more than 90 plus a 20, the sum of these two is going to be something more than 110. And since the sum of these two angles is something more than 110, and the sum of the, all of these three, 20 plus something more than 90 plus y, sum of these three angles, because it's a triangle, 
has to equal 180, that tells us this implies this implies that y must equal something less than 70. Y would have to be something less than 70 because something less than 70 plus something more than 110 would equal to 180. Y cannot be equal to 70 because 70 plus something more than 110 would equal something more than 180. Y also cannot be more than 70. Y would have to be less than 70. Y would have to be something less than 70 given the fact that the sum of the two other, sum of, given the fact that the sum of the other two angles in the triangle is more than 110. Y is something less than 70. Y is something less than 70 versus 70. Answer is B. The answer is B. Let's move on then. That was number 13. That was number 13. Just give me one second. I want to make sure that I didn't miss anything. 12, 11, yep, 10. Let's move on. Number 13. Let's do 14. Number 14, when it was given in the real exam, only 19% of the people got it right. Only 19%. Four-fifths of the people missed it. Here's what, here's what we are told. We are told that x squared equals 16, and we are told that y squared equals 64. We are told that x squared equals 16. Let me just make sure that I, I did not make a boo boo. That is not what it says here. It says y cube equals 64 y cube equals 64. And what we're being asked to compare is x versus y. Column B, column A. Very straightforward, simple problem. I'm going to go over it one more time. We are given information, two bits of information. We are told that x squared equals 16 and we are told that y cube equals 64. What I want you to do is pause the video, solve the problem yourself. Once you have done it yourself and then Start the video again and then compare your work against the work that we are about to do. Do not continue watching it. You're not going to get much out of it that way. You must do it yourself first. Do you understand? I'm going to give you five seconds to do just that, to pause and unpause. Very good. What we have to understand here is that we are told that x squared equals 16. What quantity multiplied by itself equals 16? That's the tricky part. That's why the percentage is so low, because people forget the negative root. You see? Positive 4, positive 4 squared equals 16, but so does negative 4. Negative 4, and negative 4 times negative 4, negative 4 times negative 4 also equals positive 16. So x has two possible values. x can be positive 4 or x could be negative 4. There are two possible values. This is how we write it. x squared equals, uh, we, this is how we write it. We, we would say that x equals rather, we will say that x equals x equals positive or negative 4. This is how we write it. If x happens to be positive 4, x happens to be either positive 4 or negative 4. There are two possibilities. Let's take a look at y. y we are told equals, the, we are told that cube of y equals 64. So what number multiplied by itself in a row would be 64? 3 times would be this one. 4 times 4 is 16, 16 times 4 is 64 and that's the only possibility y cannot be negative 4 because negative 4 negative 4 times negative 4 times negative 4 would be negative 64 it would be negative 64 that does not work this has to be positive 64 because that's what we have here y has to be only one value which is positive 4 y cannot be negative 4 do you understand even if y were negative 4 still would not, that would not change anything uh, i don't know why i went there y is positive 4 so y is equal to positive 4 x can be positive 4 or negative 4. If x happens to be positive 4, in this case the answer would be C. If x happens to be negative 4, then the answer would be B. As you can see, we're getting different answers. We're getting different answers. If they happen to be both 4, if they both happen to be 4, the answer would be C. If, if x happens to be negative 4, y will always be positive 4, in which case the answer would be B. Because of the fact that we're getting conflicting answer, the correct answer is D. Do you understand? That's all. That's all it is. I'm going to do something which I really wasn't planning to because I want to finish this video as soon as possible. We still have one more to go. But since I started this thing, what I said was inadvertently just came out of my mouth that even if x were allowed to be negative 4, even if x were allowed to be negative 4, it wouldn't have changed anything. They asked, well, that's what I'm going to elaborate on. We're going to do a new problem, a bonus problem. Let's do a bonus problem.
Okay, just do a bonus problem. Very simple problem, it's not a big deal. A squared equals 9 and B squared equals 9. And we have to compare, we have to compare A versus B. As you can see, A can be positive 4, positive 3 or negative 3, and B can be positive 3 or negative 3. What's the answer then? Is the answer C? The answer is not C. Answer is not C because we don't know. If A is 3 and B is 3, then the answer is C. But if A happens to be 3 and B happens to be negative 3, we don't know, we can't tell which value is. B can be positive 3 or negative 3. If B, can be, if B is negative 3, then in which case the answer would be A. We can stop right there, we're getting the conflicting answer. The correct answer to this problem is D. But of course there is one more possibility, which is maybe A is negative 3 and B is positive 3, in which case the answer would be B. We're getting conflicting answer, the correct answer in this case is D. That's what I meant by even if y were allowed to be positive 3 and uh, even if y were allowed to be positive 4 and, neg positive four and negative 4 in the, in the previous question, it wouldn't, have changed, it wouldn't have changed the fact that the answer still would have been D. Do you understand? But the y was only allowed to be 4. Do you understand? Let's do the next one. Last one, number 15. I don't know why I took so long because number 15 is going to take a while. Number 15 we are told to compare these two quantities 2 raised to 30 minus 2 raised to 29 over 2 versus 2 raised to 28. There are two ways we can go about this problem. There are two ways we can go about this problem. One choice we have at our hand, one choice we have at our hand is to solve this problem like a good schoolboy or good schoolgirl. Like, uh, like we are expected to be when we, are, when we are in the grade school. In other words, one choice that we have at our hand is to solve this problem as it's meant to be, as they expect you to solve it, which is to do it in a very classical, very traditional, very orthodox, very geeky, very nerdy, very algebraic way. In other words, to solve this problem mathematically, algebraically. We have another option, which is to cheat the system. Yes, we can cheat the system. And we can create of our own problem, we can create of our own problem a simpler version of this question. Instead of doing the question the way it is given to us, we can do a simpler version of the question. And then whatever logic, whatever rationale, whatever, uh, whatever thinking that will apply there will apply in this complicated version. And the answer is going to be the same answer. The answer is not going to change. The logic does not change. The rationale does not change. Math is math. It's just one is more complicated. That's all. Which method do you want to do first? Let's cheat the system first, shall we? Here's what you do. Here's what you do, you see? They're telling us 2 raised to 30. 2 raised to 30 is a very huge number. Let's make up a small simpler version here. Let's make up a simpler version. Instead of 2 raised to 30, let's make it 2 raised to 3. So what did we just do? We subtracted 27 from the power. Instead of 30, we have 3. We subtracted 27 from this exponents. So we're going to subtract 27 from that. So instead of 2 raised to 29, it'll be 2 raised to 2. And then we are supposed to take half of it, divided by 2, which is same as taking take the half of the top quantity. We're going to do that. We're going to take a half of that quantity. Are you with me? Let's find out what that is, shall we? That is 2 raised to 3 is 8. 8 minus 4 is 4. 8 minus 4 over 2. 8 minus 4 is 4 over 2 is 2. Now that was our column A. That was our column A. In column B, in column B, we are supposed to have 2 raised to 28. But remember, we subtracted 27 from the exponents. 30 became 3, 29 became 2, and therefore 28 will become 1. 2 raised to 1, 2 raised to 1 is, is just 2. The answer is C. The answer is C. These two columns are equal. These two columns are equal. Now let's do the same problem algebraically, shall we? Okay. I'm warning you, it's not for the, it's not for the, uh, uh, it's not for everybody. It's only, it's only for those people who can brook it. It is only for those people who can brook it. If I don't pick up and take care of it right now, I'll forget it and I'll end up erasing it and then you will wonder what brook means. Day number four. Vocabulary, day four. We learned this word in our vocabulary lesson. If you're interested in improving your vocabulary, just type in GRE vocabulary words. Day four and learn the word brook. Brook means 
To be able to brook something means to be able to tolerate something, to be able to endure something, to be able to handle something, to be able to stomach something. As long as you can stomach it, as long as you can endure it, as long as you can tolerate it, as, you can, as long as you can uh, uh, take it, that is the algebraic way, we'll do the algebraic way. And if you cannot brook it, if you cannot tolerate it, if you cannot handle it, then just ignore it, just do it this way. Do you understand? So here we go. Here we go. So we have 2 raised to, we can, we can erase this part because otherwise it's going to confuse people. We have 2 raised to 29 minus 2 raised to 28. 2 raised to, 2 raised to 30 rather, 2 raised to 30 minus 2 raised to 29 over 2, over 2 versus 2 raised to 28. I'm warning you, it is going to get quite nasty very rapidly. This is our column A, this is our column B. Let's multiply both columns by 2. We're going to multiply both columns by 2. It's okay to do that, we can do that because 2 is a positive number, we can multiply both columns by a positive number. When you multiply both columns by 2, when you multiply both columns by 2, this 2 goes away and we end up with 2 raised to 30 minus 2 raised to 29. 2 raised to 30 minus 2 raised to 29. And what do we end up here? We have 2 raised to 28 times 2 raised to 1, which is same as 2 raised to 29. Are you with me so far? We're almost done. It's a, it's a two step process. That's all it is. It's only two steps. Now let's add this quantity 2 raised to 29 here and here. 2 raised to 29. We're going to add it to both columns. When we add 2 raised to 29 to both columns, this quantity drops out. And we are left with 2 raised to 30. And here we have 2 raised to 29 plus 2 raised to 29. 2 raised to 29 plus 2 raised to 29 is 2 times 2 raised to 29. 2 times 2 raised to 29, of course is 2 raised to 30. That's it, they're equal. The answer is C. Do you understand? That's all there was. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.